would say that starting next time, maybe not this time, as well as asking any questions about what I've said so far, feel free if you have a nice example of an asymptotic series or a problem that came up in some asymptotic thing, which is certainly the case of several people here, uh, then you can say, you know, you can either come to the board if you're here or explain it uh, verbally and, you know, maybe it would be fun if we could have examples that arose in real life from participants of the course because, as I said, many of the kind of tricks and methods I'm going to show are applicable to problems that come up all the time in one's research work and so it may well be that one of you finds something in a you know, some string theory calculation or some calculation. So today is probably the last day that doesn't quite, uh, the title is gone, but I can remind you the title of this course, it's a little hubris maybe, is called Standard and Non-Standard Methods in Asymptotics. Actually, non-standard just means nobody told it to me. For all I know, it's very standard. I'm not an expert, but I love asymptotics and have played with it all my life. And so I have various tricks, and I'm sure some are known. But today is the last lecture that is definitely not non-standard because I'm talking about the Euler-McLaurin summation form and its variance, and that goes back, as the name says, to Euler, so it's an 18th century piece of mathematics. Uh, if any of you have looked at my appendix to Zeidler's book, which I mentioned last time in a reference, I'll give it at the end, uh, I'm going to follow that exposition exactly, even including the notation, because as I was preparing, it seemed idiotic to try to change every letter to a different letter, and I don't see any other order to do it. So if you've read that, you'll be very bored, and I hope you brought a book. But uh, and anyways, I said, it's relatively standard, but still, it's not quite the usual take, and it's, uh, uh, it's a lot of fun to see how these things work. And one thing I want to do with, the, with this formula, as with the um, asymptotic method I'll play, explain next time, is to give a very, very nice mnemonic, how you can remember what the answer has to be. So maybe I'll start with that. I'll state the general problem, which I've already mentioned, and that there are kind of two ways that you might think uh, how to go about answering that question, and both of them are wrong, but surprisingly, so both give the wrong answer, but if you add up the two wrong answers, you get the right answer. That's the mnemonic. That's kind of fun. I think that's my observation. I mean, it's a trivial observation, and of course, it's not really mine, but the, the mnemonic. So I'm going to fix two notations. I've already mentioned this in the first day when I gave an overview of some of the problems we're looking at. Let's say this is a nice function. For the moment, I'll just think that it might be in the complex right half plane, but let's say just on the positive real line. And for the moment, it could be, I could put greater than or equal to zero, but later, I want to allow singularities at zero. There might be you know, log t or something, so for safety, so, or r greater than or equal to zero. Of course, there are two notations, r greater than or equal, or as an interval. And nice uh, means it's small at infinity and is reasonably continuity properties. I think continuous is good enough. Uh, in practice, all the functions that actually come up are given by a formula, and they're analytic, um, you see, infinity functions. And small at infinity means it's small enough, e.g., it might be one over a, constant, a power of c, a power c of t, where that power is bigger than one. So what that means is that if I take the sum, and that's also why I omitted the term n, you know, f of zero, because I don't want to necessarily assume that f of zero makes sense. The question is this. Because f is, oops, that didn't quite work. Because f is small at infinity, let's say like 1 over t squared, or, or maybe exponentially small, anyway small, that means that the infinite sum f of nt is convergent for all t. So this is a function which is valid for all t bigger than 0. Even if f of t itself is valid at 0, so it might be, in the simplest case, it might be an actual smooth function even at 0, then uh, f of 0 is, is well defined, but of course, if you take t equals 0 here, you'll get f of 0 infinitely often, and that would never make sense. So here, I definitely want to start this summation at n equals 1, and therefore, I don't use f of 0, and that's why I don't really care about f of 0. Okay, so that's going to be the setup for, I think, all of today. And the question is, uh, 
uh, if we know, so f is a known function. If we know, no, that's an extra k. If we know how f of t looks, well, at infinity, there's no real question. It's just small. But uh, at or rather near t equals 0, can we say how this infinite sum looks? Again, near g equals 0. You see, if t is large, there's no real issue. Let's say f is exponentially large, so it's like e to the minus t. Then this sum will be e to the minus t plus e to the minus 2t plus e to the minus 3t. The first term is like f, the second is yet much smaller. And the whole thing, I mean, it, it just you see immediately what it looks like. It's just a sum of separate terms whose behavior you know. And even if f isn't that drastically small, let's say f is 1 over x squared. Well, then you'll still get 1 over x squared times the sum 1 over n squared, which is just a constant. So it, it's not really a big issue what happens at infinity. That you can read off just from the original formula. But at 0, it's not at all clear what happens. So after all, if, if t is 1 millionth, then even if f is like that, it's eventually small. But let's say you have to get 10 before it starts getting small. Then here, n will have to go up to 10 million before the terms, terms even start getting small. So of course, for a sum to converge, the terms have to go to infinity, to 0. They do go to 0, but it takes a long time until they even get small at all. You need millions of terms, and you obviously don't want to add them all up. So there are two, uh, two ways. I think I already said this the first day, but it's fun. So if I did say it, I'll repeat it. And if I, don't, I simply don't remember. If I didn't, uh, I'm saying for the first time. So one is the, well, I'll put them in chronological order. Euler came before Riemann. Why it should be the Euler zeta function. Uh, Euler didn't actually do what I said, but it's based on his mathematics. But we can pretend that he might have done this. Actually, he wouldn't. He wouldn't have given the wrong answer. So I'm, the, when I said, and Euler, Riemann, what he did is also not wrong. I'm just saying if you very blindly follow the simplest answer, a la Euler and a la Riemann, you get two different formulas. And the truth is, in fact, the sum of them. So Euler would be like this. We just think formally. So I'll make a, a back so that I can come to this later. Formally, we have g of t. So let's assume. Well, I haven't yet said what I'm assuming. And the answer is I'm going to assume many different types of things. There's just quite a bit of freedom. But let's assume first uh, that f of t simply has a power series expansion at the origin. Uh, here, I don't want to call this n. It's a good rule that I try now to tell my students and also colleagues not to use the same letter in the same context for different things, even if it's a dummy letter, because it quickly leads to confusion. So let me try to remember, and if I don't remember, somebody can shout, that in my infinite sum, this variable will be called n, but in the Taylor expansion, the index will be called n, because they're playing completely different roles. And so what I want is that there's an asymptotic expansion. So here, f, remember I said it's nice, it's maybe just smooth or continuous is good enough, or maybe it could be maybe in C infinity, maybe analytic. In most of the examples I'll have, actually all the examples I've had, it's analytic, except at 0. But at 0, sometimes it'll be analytic there, but usually it won't. It, or sometimes it won't. It'll have only, it's only C infinity. And remember, I told you in the first lecture, this was about different words actually meaning the same thing. Having an asymptotic expansion to all orders at 0 is exactly the same as being as the familiar property of being smooth, being differentiable to all orders. And so we know that this means that f is smooth. Smooth, I'll usually use, means c infinity, not just c1. Smooth at 0, so it is derivatives of all orders. And then, of course, by Taylor's theorem, bn, we know exactly what it is. It's simply the value at 0 of the nth derivative of f divided by n factorial. So now, formally, what do I have? g of t is the sum, so it's f of t plus f of 2t plus f of 3t, etc. 
So if I just formally insert that into the sum asymptotically, then I'll get bn, the sum bn times t to the n, but then I'll get bn times 2t to the n. But of course, 2t to the n is simply 2 to the n times t to the n. It's simply 3t to the n is 3 to the n. So formally, I have this. Now, obviously, that can't possibly be right, because quite apart from the fact that I have no right to interchange in this way, the inner sum simply is always divergent, no matter, unless the bn's are all zero, starting at some point. Well, in fact, unless they're all zero, this sum is always divergent. But I'm pretending that Euler uh, were completely formally, which is to some extent true, but he always justified why it was allowed in that case. So this one we know is, well, this isn't an asymptote. This is kind of the definition. This is exactly the, the value of z of s, which is 1 plus 2 to the minus s plus 3 to the minus s and so on, at minus n. And remember that this was uh, defined completely rigorous, although his arguments were a little strange, and calculated by Euler. So in other words, even though there's a totally illegitimate first step, and even that that expression, as it stands, is divergent, once I write it as a of minus n, this is a perfectly well-defined number. And this expression makes sense, because bn is finite, z of minus n is finite. I'm not saying the series converts as an absolute sum. It certainly makes sense. And if we stick in the formula that Euler found for um, z of minus n, it's minus 1 to the n. I hope I got the sign right. bn plus 1 over n plus 1, and then bn times t to the n. So this would be the Euler answer. I'm going to remind you, as I said a little last time, how, how Bernoulli numbers look. I'm going to take uh, five or five minutes or so when I finish with this introductory thing to remind you more properties of Bernoulli numbers because they're absolutely crucial if you want to do any kind of asymptotics. The Bernoulli numbers have to be you know, second nature to you. You shouldn't have to think. Now, the other way would be this. So this would be the Euler answer. The other way would be this. We had our function, and my t is very small. So here's t. Then 2t is also very small, but it's not quite as small. I have 3t, 4t you know, 100d, I mean, they go to infinity. And I'm adding up, this is f of t, f of 2t, f of 3t, f of 4t. So in other words, I'm adding up the values over these vertical lines. And the spacing of these lines is, is my small number t. So that, as t goes to 0, is exactly the way that Riemann defined the integral. The integral, so let me set if. Uh, I'll just this convenient notation. By that, I'm going to mean the integral from 0 to infinity, f of x dx. And then by Riemann, assuming that it's a well-behaved function, which we are assuming, this integral you can approximate by Riemann's sum. So this is the limit, as t goes to 0, of the corresponding sum, which is the sum of the f's. So it's the corresponding, you all know the argument. Here's f of t, the width is t. So if I just take each value and make a rectangle to the right, it might be below the thing, it might be below, above the thing, then the sum of these rectangles is an area which is asymptotically equal to the integral, and that sum is exactly t times the sum g of t, uh, f of t, f of 2t, f of 3t, and so on, which is what I call g of t. So this is a fact, and therefore that tells us that g of t is asymptotic to if divided by t. And that's simply a theorem. That's because of the definition of the Riemann integral. But it doesn't give the full asymptotic expansion. It only gives, remember I mentioned that this symbol is used, unfortunately, in mathematics for two things. And even more unfortunately, I'll use it for both because it's convenient. And it's always clear from context. This means only that the ratio of that and that is 1. So this means that g of t is asymptotically equal to a constant over t. And that constant is 1. Actually, I'm lying because it might not be that the ratio is 1. If if happens to be 0, I never said that f is positive, then it's actually not 0 over t. What I really mean is it's this plus little o of 1 over t, so smaller terms than what I'm writing. Of course, if i of f is literally 0, uh, that's always a nuisance when you talk about functions being f is you know, asymptotic to g. You have to be careful. If you subtract something from both, something can be 0. The ratio might not be 1. But here I'm using tilde in this weak sense. g of t is equal to i of t plus o of smaller terms, 
Whereas here, I'm using the sense of an asymptotic series. And that asymptotic series makes sense because every formal power series is a perfectly good asymptotic expansion. And so the proposition, which I'll prove uh, in a bit, is that, as I already said, that the actual formula for this wide class of functions is that now asymptotically in the strong sense to all orders, I have, G of t has a Leroy expansion. There's one negative power of t, which is indeed the integral, as Riemann tells you it has to be. And the other terms, and that's the beautiful thing that you should remember. That's the key, key property of the whole thing. The constant term, oh, sorry, the Laurent term, the 1 over t term is global. To compute that, you have to integrate f all the way from 0 to infinity. So if I change f by adding some little hump, which is compactly supported away from 0, I'll change that constant. But all of the other terms here in this expansion, all of them to all orders, are just the BNT to the end, and they only depend on the behavior of f near 0. And that's sort of always true for a large class of functions. The behavior of g of t to all orders in t uh, depends only on the behavior of f to all orders near t equals 0, except for a single constant comes from over t, and that comes from the integral. So, OK, so we'll, we'll give the proof of that, which is quite easy. Later, the proof will be it's just a variant of the euler maclaurin formula. And so my next topic, certainly many of you know it, uh, but there are many ways to see it. Also, some of you may have just learned it without ever seeing a proof or forgot the proof. And since it's a basic, basic phase statement about, well, of mathematics anyway, and analysis, but in spe especially of asymptotics, I think it's worth giving. So in order to do that, I have to tell you more about Bernoulli numbers than I already said something last time. So let me remind you several things about Bernoulli numbers. So first of all, the Bernoulli numbers are just some numbers. Let's call them BR. They're rational numbers indexed by an index, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. The first few are 1 minus 1 half, 1 sixth, 0, minus 1 30th. And except for B1, they're always 0 for odd indices. So now I won't put all the zeros. There's now another 0. So if I put 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, that should certainly be enough to get a good feeling. Uh, they alternate in signs. So it's a sixth minus a 30th, 1 over 42. By, by coincidence, this has the same value for 8 as it did for 4, minus 1 30th. 10 is the first one, which is not an integer. Uh, the reciprocal of an integer, it's 5 over 66. And you might think, aha, so something changes at 10. But actually, that's wrong. I'll, tell, I'll explain that in one second. Something changes at 12. So 12, well, it's negative because they should alternate, is 691 over 2730. Now, the numerator is prime. The denominator, on the other hand, is highly factored. It's 2 times 5 times 273, which is 3 times 91, which is 3 times 7 times 13. So you see that this is highly factored. It's 2 times 3 times 5 times 7 times 13. This is highly factored. It's 2 times 3 times 11. The numerators are prime. They aren't in general prime, but they don't have very small prime factors. The next one, which is again positive, is again very simple, 7, 6. And the next one is again a prime, as it happens, 36, 17 over that number I didn't remember. It's got a minus sign over 510. So these are the first few. And as I think I mentioned last time, we should really call them the Seiki Bernoulli numbers, because the great mathematician Takakazu Seiki, who died in 1708, or was born in 1706, so a whole generation earlier, he discovered the Bernoulli numbers before or at the same time. Bernoulli did, but in any case, both of them discovered them before, uh, uh, the, before the other had published, because in both cases, it was published posthumously after they had both died. So it was certainly independent. And he found it more or less in the same context, which is the, the formula for the sum of the first uh, n squares, cubed, fourth powers, so the sum of the first n fixed powers. So we have this. And since I mentioned this numerology, which isn't important for this course, let me say that b are the actually interesting numbers you should divide by r. Well, if r is not 0. And this is 1 over an integer. 
See, that's why I said 10 isn't really exceptional, because if I divide by r, this is 1 half, this is 1 12th, it's still 1 over an inch, so this is up to sign 1 over 120, 1 over 252, 1 over 240, this is 1 over 132. It's still got numerator 1, because the 10 cancel the 5. This is a 691, this is a 3617, but 14 is still uh, integral, because I divide by 14. And in fact, it's a theorem, well, let's take r to be even. This is true if and only if r, so let's say r is bigger than 0 and even, because otherwise they're all 0 and it's stupid. Uh, it's true ex if and only if it is one of those numbers. Now, the proof of that is completely trivial, namely the b n over n factorials have an easy asymptotics, and they go rapidly to infinity. So after a bit, actually starting at 16, they, BR of R is bigger than one in absolute value. So it's certainly not one over an integer. But there's a deep reason for this. Who can tell me? Somebody has to stay. What, what do these numbers remind you of? Are there no number theorists in the room? Nobody who loves number theory. So let me remind you from yesterday's lecture, if you were there, Ramanujan's loves my love, and therefore the love of every self-respecting number theorist, are formulas, which there are many, asymptotics, and multiple forms. So I'm not going to talk about multiple forms in this course. I might a little bit later at some point, but very briefly. But these are here. I should really, it would, maybe if I'd called it K, everybody would have thought of this immediately. Because K is the standard weight used for the weight of a multiple form. And so we have the famous Eisenstein series, E2. E4, E6, E8, E10, and E14. And each of these, for instance, E2 of tau, is equal to 1 minus 24Q minus, uh, now I have to do it in my head, 2 plus 1 is 3, 72Q squared, and so on. I'm going to say in a minute what these are. E4 of tau is 1 plus 240q plus 2160q squared, and so on. E6 of tau is 1 minus 504q, and some more stuff. And these ek of tau, if k is 4, 6, 8, or bigger, so even but not 2, then e6 of tau is up to a constant, which I could write down, but I won't. It's the sum m tau plus n to the k. This is the famous Eisenstein series of weight k, the sum over all pairs of integers except, of course, 0, 0, which would give you a, a pull. This sum converges absolutely, and the fact that it uh, converges absolutely means that it's a multiple form of weight k, which I remind you again means that for all matrices a, b, c, d, which have, where a, b, c, and d are integers, and the determinant is 1, so that's the group SL2 of z, if I replace tau by a tau plus b over c tau plus d, then this whole thing is a factor, c tau plus d to the k. And what's left is m times a tau plus b plus n times c tau plus d, but that's just some other m prime tau plus n prime. And they also run over the same lattice, because this is the automorphism of the lattice. And so you get uh, simply the same function. And such a thing is called a multiple form, and as I said, Yesterday, we'll say many times, multiple forms are absolutely wonderful things and have beautiful properties. So ek of tau is this property. And ek of tau, the way I've normalized it, always starts 1 plus something times q and so on. And I didn't say what q was, but now I will. This formula implies a particular, since certainly the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1 is in SL2z. Uh, this implies in particular that ek of tau plus 1 is simply equal to ek of tau. Now, there's no automorphic factor because c is 0 and d is 1. And therefore, ek of tau is a power, has a Fourier expansion, which means it's a power series in q, which is e to the 2 pi i tau. So that power series always starts with 1. Well, that's an empty state because I've normalized to make it start with 1. Actually, there is a way to make it non-empty and make this actually slightly shorter, if I just sum over co-prime integers, then I've already eliminated one, then you can see that any pair of integers at all, if it's not zero, is a unique integer called the GCD, positive integer, times a pair of co-prime integers. So therefore, up to a scalar factor, which is the Riemann or Euler zeta function at k, it's the same if I include 
uh, if I include this condition, uh, and if I do that, then the only terms that contribute to the Collins term are where m is zero, and then n is plus or minus one, k is even, so I get it twice, I have to divide by two. So if you want to know what the constant is, you can write it like that, but you could also put one over two z of k times the sum I wrote before. Now, each ek starts like this, but in fact, ek of tau always starts is one minus two k over bk times q, and the rest is a very nice function, which we'll come back to actually later today. This is the standard uh, calculation. I'm not going to give it because this is not a course of multiple forms, but if you look at uh, my book, well, my chapter of, of, a, of a book, but it's the chapter I'm quoting called The One, Two, Three of Multiple Forms, which uh, anyway is kind of a basic book to get to know what's in it if you want to do any kind of number theory because multiple forms are everywhere. Uh, then you'll find the proof. It's not at all difficult, but I'm not going to give it. And the expansion of this thing is that, except for the constant, which is one, there's a common factor, which is minus 2k over bk. Remember, bk is zero if k is odd, but k isn't odd because it's four, six, or something bigger. Actually, even two is allowed. Uh, and then the coefficients here are for each q, you sum all of the divisors for each power q to the n, you sum the divisor of n to the power k minus one. But now, the statement that I had before, which is that this number is the reciprocal of n, well, this is the reciprocal. So this will be in z of q, if and only if, by what I already claimed, k has one of these values. But if you know multiple forms even a little bit, you know that that means that the space of cus forms uh, is empty. So I remind you very briefly, mk, or more precisely, mk of SL2z is the set of multiple forms of weight k. I won't write down the definition, but it's essentially, well, it is just this. It's functions f, such that f of a tau plus b over c tau plus d is c tau plus d to the k f of tau plus some modest growth condition. And this space, if k is, if I exclude four, two, which is a little special, this space always contains the Eisenstein series because, as I said, that is a multiple form. So these are multiple forms of weight k for the reason I said that's not true if k is 2. If k is 2, the sum still converges if you do it in, in some order. And we actually first sum the internal sum over n and then over m, and then we'll get this formula. But it's not absolutely convergent, so the argument is not true. And it's not quite mod, but there's a slight hiccup called quasi-multiplicity. I'll come back to that when we do an asymptotic calculation in a few minutes. But E4, E6, and so on are multiple forms. So we certainly have Ek of tau. And then Mk of tau is the sum of Sk, or Sk of SL2c, at the multiples of the Eisenstein series. And these are the cos forms, which in the case of SL2c, simply means they're multiple forms which have no constant term. So the constant term is 0. So now, uh, these, so if you look at the ring of all multiple forms, then it's this famous theorem that it's generated by E4 and E6, and it's a free, freely generated, there are no relations. And so a basis, if here's k and here's a basis, mk, then for 2, there's nothing. For 4, there's E4. For 6, there's E6. For 8, there's E4 squared. For 10, there's E4, E6. For 14, there's only one possibility, E4 squared, e E6. So it's a one-dimensional space, so there are again no cos forms. But for 12, there are two different forms. E4 cubed has weight 12 and E6 squared. Let me write that in a place where you can see it. So E4 cubed, which starts 1 plus 720 Q, etc., is a multiple form of weight 12, and so is E6 squared, which starts 1 minus 2 times 504. And so when I take their difference, E4 cubed minus E6 squared, it starts 1728, and in fact 1728 divides all of the terms. So now it starts with Q minus 24Q squared, and this is the famous dedicate eta function, which will also, well, the 24th power, will also come back today and many times and you played a role in the Ramanujan talk 
yesterday. So Delta has this famous product expansion, which I'm not going to explain now, but many of you have seen. And that's a cost form because it starts with one. This function is called by everybody delta, uh, and it's a cost form. And in higher weight, uh, M, uh, SK in general, every cost form is divisible by this delta, and then the remaining weight is k minus 12. So the only times that you have no cost forms is when either the weight is less than 12 or the weight is bigger than 12, but there are no multiple forms of that weight. There were no multiple forms of weight, too, and so M14 still works. So this is an equivalence, but that's not just a random coincidence. That's a theorem. There's a beautiful, well, conjecture in the most general situation, certainly a theorem here, which is that if you have any two multiple forms, maybe different weights, different groups, even different types, they might be Hilbert multiple forms. I don't want to go into that. Let's say for the moment, two multiple forms on SL2Z. Then there's always, they're always linked by a chain of congruences. So if you say two multiple forms are congruent if, they're, if their difference is divisible by some number, say some prime number p, then we make an equivalence relation and the meta statement is that the whole set of all nice multiple forms, heck eigenvalues, I'm not going to go into it, is a connected graph. You can get from any form to any other. But if you stay in a given weight, it should literally be true that there's, uh, but it's true. OK, so what does that mean? We have EK. And we have delta. But now there has to be a congruence between them, because any two multiple forms would be related by congruence. That congruence, if I rescale EK, so it's actually called GK, and I'll use it later today. If I let GK of tau, which is a multiple of EK of tau, and I de define the multiple so that all of the horrible coefficients that I had here in this formula, remember all of them had a common huge factor, which was this Bernoulli number. I take it out. So now that becomes simply the constant term, bk over 2k plus the sum n from 1 to infinity. And here, I'll use the standard notation, sigma k minus 1 of n q to the n. So for instance, uh, sigma k minus 1 of 4 is 1 plus 2 to the k minus 1 plus 4 k, k minus 1. As I said in general, sigma k minus 1 of n is the sum of the device of n to the power k minus 1. So now this is all integral. These coefficients are all integral. But here I have an extra one. But if I've delta, then there has to be a congruence between them. But delta, I mean not delta, any cusp form, but a cusp form is coefficient 0. So therefore, that prime has to divide the difference between the Bernoulli number and zero, which means that p divides the numerator of bk over 2k. As soon as there's a cusp form, that's got to happen. And that's why this strange coincidence. I would not prepared any of this. It just struck me as I was telling that it's such a nice piece of mathematics to know that uh, everybody should have seen. And if you don't know multiple forms, I hope this is already enough to begin to whet your appetite. Whatever multiple forms are, even if you've never seen them, so they're defined by this very simple formula. Well, if I define a general multiple form, of weight k, it's simply this. And they have such strong properties that, for instance, if you have any multiple form of weight 12 on SL2z, it has to be a combination of E4 cubed and E6 squared. So for instance, to prove the very non-trivial identity, if you try to do it directly, that E4 squared is E8, the proof is automatic if you know this, because they both have weight 8, and they start with 1, and it's a one-dimensional space. And similarly, to prove this identity, which is very non-trivial, you prove that this product is a multiple form, which is not completely easy. But then E4 cubed, E6 squared of that have to be linear depend dependent. And you just look at two or three coefficients, and you find the coefficients. So multiple forms are an extremely strong and, and beautiful thing. But in particular, they have a direct arithmetic connection with the Bernoulli numbers and zeta values, specifically as the constant term of the renormalized Eisenstein series, which as I say, I'll come back to. So that was a long digression, and I, I'm going to remove all of this now, except the little table, and go back to, and also this the thing about the, I, I put here the primes. I can mention a couple of theorems. So the, I talked about the, the numerator, that it's never 1. But P divides the denominator of Bn. In fact, even of Bn over n, this is a famous theorem von Stadt-Clausen, if and only if P minus 1 divides n. So here I just erased it, but here we have the primes 
2, 3, 5, 7, and 13. If you subtract 1 from 2, 3, 5, 7, and 13, you get 1, 2, 4, 6, and 12. Uh, 1, 2, 4, 6, and 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16, and they all divide 16, and similarly here for 12. You get 1, 2, 3, 6, and 12, so you get, uh, anyway, it always works. It's a theorem. Uh, the numerators are also very interesting. Now, to, this isn't really enumerated because it's really Vn over n that counts. These numerators are primes. Such primes are called irregular. That was Kummer's great discovery, that you can divide primes into regular and irregular. And the for any prime that occurs in the numerator of Bn over n, so I omit the trivial factor, is by definition, that's the definition, that is an irregular prime. And the first one in the sense of the first one you see in a table of Bernoulli numbers is 691. The second one is 3,617. Later, the numerators have several prime factors often, so you get many. But the actual first irregular prime is 37, but it only occurs in B18. And the next one is, I think, 67. I've forgotten. There are only three under 100. And Kummer proved both cases, the first and the second case, uh, of Fermat's last theorem for all regular primes. So the primes that don't occur in the numerator of any Bernoulli number are much, much easier to get at in deep number theory. That's not at all elementary number theory, uh, what Kummer did. And in particular, Fermat's last theorem, which has now been proved for all uh, primes using my Wiles at company, using multiple forms, an incredibly deep proof. But the proof of Kummer was very deep at the time, and it's still difficult, but it's much more elementary. And that's exactly for the primes that don't occur in any. So just for general background, Bernoulli numbers are fascinating arithmetically. Their denominators are very simple. We know which primes, and we even know which powers. OK? But uh, uh, namely, P cannot divide the denominator Bn more than once. So if it occurs, the only higher powers are if P minus 1 divides N and a power of P divides N. So we know exactly what the denominator is, but the numerator are these, have these mysterious irregular primes that are much deeper than the regular primes, much harder to deal with from the point of view of number theory. That was, again, a digression, but this is not a course in number theory at all. Asymptotics is kind of disjoint from number theory. But nevertheless, I wanted to say some of these very, very beautiful facts. OK, so that was the, just a list. And so rem I remind you that last time I said the standard definition of the Bernoulli numbers, but it's kind of a little silly because it's, I mean, it's a perfectly good definition. Of course, everyone uses it, including certainly me all the time. It's very convenient. But as a definition, it's not satisfying. Sorry, just let me finish the sentence, and I'll answer. A mathematical definition should be, of course, correct and meaningful, but it should be motivated. One should not, as people do all the time in their papers, say, let f of t be the following function, then formula that takes up half a page, and they don't tell anybody how they found it. Three pages later, there's a theorem about f of t. A definition in mathematics should be motivated. You say, we do something, and we see here's an interesting function. Let's call it f of t. So this is not very well motivated. Why the heck should we care about Forget the factorial, that OK, but why this particular function? And as I said last time, there are many reasons. But you, you had a question, so. Uh, yes. Oh, you even have a microphone. I hope this That's is working. Way. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you said it was a digression, so maybe it's not so such a relevant question. But I just had two questions that came to mind. So you wrote this uh, expansion in powers of q. And it, uh, it just seemed that these coefficients were growing really quickly in the no, beginning. No, not at all quickly. But they're not. Well, polynomially. It, no, but I meant. Um, no, it's so it not very quick. It's only polynomially. Uh, I'll answer that. No, that's a very good question. Well, let's look at e10 I didn't finish the question. of n. So it's some constant, which is b10 over 12. So it's minus 1 over 132. If I did it right, I may have. Oh, it's bk over 2k. So it's over 264. And then it's 1 times q. Then it's 2 to the 9th plus 1. Now, of course, you can say that's a big number. It's 513. Uh, and then it's 3 to the 9th plus 1 times q cubed. But when I get to the nth coefficient, it's n to the 9th plus uh, other things to the 9th, q to the n. But this is also n to the 9th times the sum of the device of n of 1 over d to the 9th. Certainly, right? Because the device of d of n come in pairs, d and n over d. So this sum, sorry, d to the 9th, the sum even to infinity is less, well, so here it's strictly less, than z of 9, which is less than 2. So this coefficient is O of n to the 9th. So sure, it's big, but it's only polynomially big. It's n to the 9th. Q is less than 1, because 
uh, and therefore q to the n is exponentially small. So these series all converge extremely rapidly. There's no problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, and then I was also wondering about. Uh, Thanks, by the way, for the question. So uh, if you have it. questions, please ask. I mean, they're very elementary because I'm not used to this thing. Uh, and also, I was wondering how you see that uh, from this Q expansion that this gives a real number when tau is real, because I think you're summing over phases. No, now, no, like no. Tau, of... tau, uh, you don't see it because it's huh. completely false. Huh. And in fact, uh, well, it, well, sorry, it is true that Q is real if tau is real for a very simple logical reason. Tau isn't real, and therefore. Everything is true if tau were real because it isn't real. What's true is if tau is uh, in the on the positive imaginary axis, then q, which was e to the 2 pi i tau, is certainly real. And in fact, it's between 0 and 1. But I didn't say because I was uh, in, actually because I forgot. Tau should be an I wrote because I learned these things in Germany, a German age. Some people write a, this kind of age. That's a German capital H, Fraktur in Czech. If tau, is, this tau must be in the upper half plane, which is the set of complex numbers, or I can call them z since I've already, such that the imaginary part of z is strictly positive. So tau, whatever it is, is not real. It's in the strict upper half plane. And that exactly means that i tau has strictly negative real part, because i times i. And therefore, q to the i tau, uh, so that's if it's real. But in general, uh, q is less than 1. And uh, of course, it's also not zero. But then in the limit, you can think of what happens at q equals zero and sort of add a point at infinity. So indeed, uh, q is always less than, I don't care whether q is real or not, but q is always less than one in absolute value. And therefore, in the sum I just had, uh, q to the nth is like e to the minus sum n epsilon. It's much, much smaller than n to the ninth. So although these powers are big and look forbidding, they're actually small as ontologically compared to what they're multiplying. So yeah, thanks for both questions. I'll come back. This function is going to come back even today, and possibly later in the course. Well, actually, now at this speed, maybe it won't be today. It'll be the beginning of next time, uh, so Thursday. But uh, I'm not going to explain this expansion. As I said, it's easy. It's written out in many textbooks, but in particular in the one, two, three of modular forms, which is, of course, the best textbook. So please, everybody, buy it and keep a copy under your pillow and fall asleep every day reading it. Uh, so you, you know the basics of multiple forms, I think, personally, I think every pure mathematician should know the basic definitions of properties, because they come up really in all kinds of contexts, certainly in everywhere in physics, electrodynamics, but also in every part of mathematics, certainly not just in number theory. OK, but I'm not talking about multiple forms. I'll erase all of this, the positive digression. And now no more questions about it, unless you have one at the end. But I should get moving. So this is the standard definition. And by the way, if you, here's an exercise, and I'll use it in a few minutes, that if I take the log of 1 minus e to the minus x, well, this starts with, if x is very small, this starts as log x. I'm going to put a minus sign to make it positive. Uh, then it starts log of 1 over x. And the further coefficients, actually, I should call them t. There's no reason here to change variables. It's log of 1 over t. And the further coefficients are exactly like they were before, namely bk over k factorial, except that there's a t to the k over k. So the proof is obviously not very hard. The right-hand side, if you differentiate it, is essentially the same as what we had here. But you have to differentiate and multiply by t. And then you'll check that they're consistent, but there's a small question since I've differentiated. There could be a constant of integration. You have to look at the beginning of the expansion to see that it's true, but it's completely easy. So that's, if you want yet another definition, even more artificial, of if you don't like the log 1 over t, of course, I could have put log of t over 1 minus e to the minus t is equal, and then I'd get just of that term. So that's also a definition, uh, even less natural than the first one. Uh, as I said, another definition and another function which is very close uh, to t over tan t, if I replace t by i t, would be x over tangent x. So this one, if I add, so remember this thing starts 1 minus a half t plus, uh, sorry, 1 minus, yeah, that's right, plus a 12 t squared. And all the other terms are even. So if I add a half t to it, it becomes an even function. And if you think about it, you'll see that's actually t over 2 divided by hyperbolic tangent of t over 2. So if I change 
t over 2 to i x, it becomes x over tangent x. And so that's also a nice expansion. Of course, it's an even function. So it's uh, plus or minus, depending on the sign, uh, bk times, I think now it's 2x to the k over k factorial x to the k. And the plus or minus depends on whether k over 2 is even or odd. OK, so those are kind of different ways defining. Then, as I told you last time, bn of x, the nth Bernoulli polynomial, is usually defined in, in most books by the sum k from 0 to n, and then binomial coefficient bk x to the n minus k. So this is a monic polynomial of degree n. It starts x to the n. The next term is minus n over 2 x to the n minus 1. And the last term is always bn, because bn by definition. But then, as I explained last time, this Bernoulli polynomial actually has better properties I want to keep the proposition, so, but I've written it there, so I can remove the two ways here. So, uh, so the Bernoulli polynomial has lots of nice properties. One, it's uh, practically easy. Well, first of all, I gave you the good characterization uh, last time, which is that if you take the Bernoulli polynomial and you integrate it from x to x plus 1, if I'm correct, I should put a different variable, x prime. So I take, so here's the Bernoulli polynomial, and I go, I integrate from x to x plus 1. Then what I'll get is, of course, a polynomial, and it's obviously still modic of degree n, because if x is large, then x prime is very near to x asymptotically, and bn of x prime is x prime to the n, uh, which is asymptotically x to the n, so I have x to the n times 1. So this certainly starts, uh, it's a polynomial which starts with x to the n, but actually it's exactly x to the n. And as I said last time, that's a complete one-line characterization, neither inductive, there are also inductive definitions, many definitions, but this is the very simplest direct intrinsic definition, bn is the polynomial whose integral from x to x plus 1 is x to the n. Now from that, or the generating function or anything else, it's impossible not to find a proof of this if you use any definition. The derivative of any bn of x is the previous one, and even more interesting property, the difference between bn of x plus 1 and bn of x. Well, what is it? If I integrate that difference from x to x plus 1, I'll get x plus 1 to the n minus x to the n. But that exactly means that this difference has to be an x to the n minus 1. It has to be the derivative of x to the n. And you can see that almost in your head if you uh, think carefully from this property. It, it implies this immediately. And this is the most interesting property. And this, actually, this is the most important property of Bernoulli polynomials. But you can't use it as a definition simply because it only defines bn up to a constant. You could add a constant to bn. So for, let me make a little table, n and bn of x. The b0 of x is, of course, 1. It's a monic polynomial of degree 0. The next is x minus 1 half. The next is x squared minus x plus a sixth. The next is x cubed minus 3 halves x plus 1 half x, uh, x squared plus 1 half x. There's no constant derivatives. Remember, the odd Bernoulli numbers are 0, and so, so on. So you see that if I take b3 of x plus 1 minus b3 of x, I'll get 3x squared. But that would be equally true if I had a constant here. So this doesn't fix the constant. The constant is exactly what we want, because that is the Bernoulli number. Actually, it does if you add the previous thing, because if you say this also has to have the previous one as its derivative, uh, then this term, which we do know, will give that term by differentiating. Uh, we have to do it correctly. But anyway, so th these two properties certainly define Bn uniquely, but that's too heavy. That's overkill as a definition. But this implies in particular, and this is what both Seiki and Bernoulli wanted to have and found, uh, that if you take the sum, let me call it uh, A, so I don't have two Ns floating around. If I take the sum of the first A natural numbers to some 
power n, then I can compute that if n is fixed, I have to sum the first fourth powers, then I'll get a formula. Well, for instance, I think everyone knows the formula, well, certainly everyone knows the formula one plus two up to a is a squared a times a plus one over two. But probably most people know the formula. Take the squares, you get a times a plus one times two a plus one over six. And if you take the sum of the cubes, then you get square of, of a times a plus one over two. But for each, uh, for each power, there's a polynomial. And that polynomial I started to write here is the n plus first polynomial of a plus one minus its constant term, which is bn plus one, and then divided by n plus one. And that just follows from this by summing it up. So in other words, if you know the Bernoulli polynomials, you know how to add up the powers, fixed powers of them. And that was a problem that naturally suggests itself to mathematicians both in the West and in the East. And it was solved, as I say, independently and at the same time by Seke and Bernoulli. OK, so, so much for the Bernoulli numbers and the Bernoulli polynomials. So now I want to explain the euler mclaurin summation formula. So now I can move to the table. So let me take a function first, which is a smooth function, let's say, on the interval 0, 1. I don't want to take any risks, so let's say the closed interval. So I've, I'm, I have a function from 0 to 1. And the function is, as a graph, it's smooth. It's smooth for both of them. It's smooth on that interval. OK? Then I do the following calculation. I want to calculate the integral of f of x dx in some other way. So the idea is this. The first step is completely artificial, but then you'll see that inductively you can keep doing it, and then it's not artificial at all. You say that this is the same as d of x minus a half, because after all, d of a half is 0. But that is the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x d of the first Bernoulli polynomial, because the first Bernoulli polynomial was x minus a half. So now by integration by parts, that's the same as the product f of x b1 of x, evaluated at 1 and at 0, and you subtract, minus the integral from 0 to 1, b1 of x, f prime of x dx. Now, b1 of 1 is a half, and b1 of 0 is minus a half. So you get f of 1 minus minus f of 0. So what you actually get is the average value, which is what you'd expect, because I have my smooth function. Let me make it more interesting. So here is the value. And if I take the, the average value of f of 0 and f of 1, that's the simplest approximation, the simplest thing to guess. If you only know the values of f of the two endpoints, then the, the obvious guess is it's the average. So we start f of 0. And now the second term, I can do it again, because we just have the property that the derivative of each bn is n times the previous one. So b1, I can again write as the derivative of b2 of x, but now divided by 2, because b2 prime is 2 times b1. But now I can do the same thing. So now I'll get f of 0 plus f of 1 over 2. And now again, by integration by parts, you'll have minus f prime times b2 of x over 2, evaluated at 1 and at 0. But another simple property that I didn't write here, it follows easily from all of this, is that once n is bigger than 1, actually, if n is different from 1, then not only bn of 0 is bn, which is the definition, but bn of 1 is also bn. And in fact, more generally, not that I'll need it for anything, bn is symmetric or antisymmetric around the point a half. So in particular, if n is uh, the values at 0 and 1, are the same up to a sign minus 1 to the n. But except for b1, that sign is always 1. Because if n is odd, then the Bernoulli number is 0 anyway. So when I do this next calculation, b2 of x times f prime of x at 0 and 1, in both cases, I simply get b2, of, b2 over 2. Here, I'll have f prime of 1, now minus f prime of 0. And then by integration by parts again, you get the value at the endpoints. You have to change the sign 
so the minus becomes plus. And now you get b2 of x times d of f prime of x, which is f double prime of x, b2 of x over 2, dx. And now you see what's going on. I can do it again. Now I write b2 of x over 2, which is 2 factorial, as d of b3 of x over 3 factorial, because that's this formula. And so I keep going. And so by induction, I'm sorry that it's hard to read. That's this. Uh, Last time Walter said that one of the chalks, I thought I took blue chalk, but basically none of the chalks are very good. And so if I erase the board, it's still full of all the previous formulas, and it makes it very hard to read anything. But I mean, there, there is probably a wet sponge, but then I have to dry the board like they do in Germany, and that's also a nuisance. Also, I don't see it. So, uh, so if I keep going, just by induction, the induction is very easy, but I better take my notes so I don't get it completely wrong. What I'll get, the first term is the only exceptional one because all of the terms with higher derivatives will have a bn or actually bn plus 1. And remember, except for b1, the Bernoulli polynomial is the same value at 1 and 0. So when I have a product of a, of a Bernoulli number and a derivative, I'll have simply the Bernoulli polynomial times derivative at 0 and 1. I'll get the Bernoulli number times always the difference of the derivatives, except for the very first time where I get this, the sum divided by 2 as it should be. It had to be the average value. So here's the form. If I do this capital N times, then I'll have n minus 1 terms, and they look like this. Minus 1 to the n, bn plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And then, as I said, all the terms except for the 0th derivative, you're taking the difference of fn of 0 and fn of 1. So the derivative, the nth derivative of f at 1 minus the nth derivative at 0. And then the remainder term will have dn of x over n factorial dx times the capital nth derivative of f. Now let me say that f is actually not just for between 0 and 1, but also between 1 and 2, and between 2 and 3, and so on. So now I will have the same formula if I look at the interval not from 0 to 1, but from 1 to 2, or from 2 to 3. So more generally, if I just shift things by m, I'll get that the integral from m minus 1 to m of f of x dx, well, it'll be f of m minus 1 plus f of m over 2 plus the sum n from 1 to capital N minus 1, minus 1 to the n, b n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial times f n of the right endpoint minus f the nth derivative of the left, left endpoint. But now there's a slight uh, thing to worry about, which is that this was minus 1. I get minus 1 to the n integral from 0 to, from n minus 1 to n. Zero again at the nth derivative of n on this interval. But now it's not bn of x. I've shifted the interval by m minus 1. It's bn shifted by x minus m plus 1. But m minus 1 is just the integer part. So let me define it. This is a very important definition. It comes up in many places in mathematics. Not everyone used this notation, but it's fairly standard. The reduced Bernoulli polynomial is defined as bn of x minus its integer part, or if you prefer, bn of the fractional part. So now it's between 0 and 1, it's the Bernoulli polynomial, and then you just turn it into a periodic function. So there's a slight, so let's do it, for instance, b2 of x, b2 of x bar. Well, at 0 and at 1, we already said it's x squared minus x plus sixth. So it starts at a sixth. Its lowest value is uh, here at minus a twelfth. That's here. But then remember, these two values are equal. So now when I make it periodic, it's, it's a step function that looks like that. But it's a continuous function, because b n of 0 and b n of 1 were the same. So b n bar of x is always a continuous function. Uh, b 0 bar of x is very continuous. It's even analytic. It's the only one that's analytic, because of course, it's simply the constant. I mean, if you make that periodic, 
only be one if x causes you a headache, because remember, the graph is from 0 to 1. It was x minus a half, so it goes from minus a half to a half. And then it's a sawtooth function, because I want to make it periodic. And so I could say I put the value zero, minus a half here or plus a half, but I don't do either one. I take the average value, because that's what you do when you do Fourier transforms. So b, I won't ever use it, but b1 of x, b1 bar of x is the fractional part of x minus a half if x is not an integer, but it's 0 if x is an integer. But anyway, let's see here my n is not going to be 1. It's going to be large very soon. So here, this bn, I could have equally written bn bar of x, because between 0 and 1, they're the same. And I don't care about the values at 0 and 1 I'm integrating. It's measured 0. So therefore, here I can put bn bar. It was really bn bar of x minus m plus 1. So that is the integer part. And so that's the formula that I now get. And, and it doesn't matter at all. And the m's only play a role that the limits of integration with the functions, the nth derivative, and then this bn bar. So now I continue that calculation. And now you see the whole point and why this only works with Bernoulli numbers. There are lots of other se sequence of polynomials that have this property that if I have any sequence of polynomials, let's call them bn of x so I don't have to write. Well, I can always make a sequence of polynomials with this property. Because if I already have b10, I know the derivative of b11. That determines it up to a constant. I pick any constant I want. So I integrate the predecessor, and then I just keep doing it. So there are lots of sequences like that. But only the Bernoulli numbers will have the property that except for b1, the values at 0 and 1 will be the same. And therefore, what we got here is a difference between m and m minus 1. Anybody who works with series looks at this, and the only reasonable thing to do with that is sum it over m. And it, 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 uh, uh, it, it uh, telescopes. So for all uh, natural numbers, m, I now find that the integral from 0 to capital M of f of x dx is equal to, now the first term is slightly different. It doesn't telescope. But because of the halves, you get the whole sum, which is what you'd expect for Riemann uh, integral. I mean, roughly, you should have the sum of the terms should be roughly the integral. But the end terms, you don't know whether you should put them on the left or the right. So indeed, you, do, you count them with multiplicity half. This is what you always do if you have a sum like that. You count the edge terms with multiplicity half because of the symmetry to the left and the right of the edge. So if I add up these terms, f of m minus 1 plus f of m, so I'm summing. Uh, this process is you sum m goes from 1 up to capital M. Then I'll get f of 0 half a time, f of 1 half, and another half. So I'll get all of that. Then these middle terms will telescope, as I just said. So here at the Bernoulli number, I don't really need the minus 1 to the end, except for one exceptional case. It's n is always odd, since b n, b n, plus, n plus 1 has to be even, so this is always minus except for one term, but it's easier to put it than to write a separate term. And now this term, as I said, will simply telescope. So although it's a sum of many terms, in the end, it only cares about the end terms, m and 0. And then the last term is, I'm not sure if I lost a sign, so it might be minus. I hope I got it right. Uh, this would be integral from 0 to m, f n of x, e n, but now this periodic version, very new number, over n factorial dx. That is the euler mclaurin summation formula. So maybe I should put a big red circle around it, because this is one of the most important, well, it's certainly one of the easiest and oldest formulas of all of uh, analysis. And you use it all, of, all the time in life. So the euler mclaurin summation formula. Yes, I'm listening. It's just um, when you write bn plus 1, do you divide by n plus 1 or n plus 1 factorial? Oh, uh, that was, thank you. That you divide by n plus 1 factorial, naturally. It was a typo. In this formula that I'm going to have later, you divide by n plus 1, but we'll get there. OK, thank you. So that's the euler mclaurin formula. Now, let's assume I can now erase this, because either you are taking notes, you're not, but anyway, it's, you're not going to read it again at the beginning. So the end of the formula is still there. Now we go back and assume that the function is small at infinity. But let's assume that f and small just means that for the moment it tends to 0, it tends to 0. A little rapidly, I don't really care. But it should be smoothly. So I don't want a function, for instance, you could take 
e to the minus x times sine of e to the 10x. Then if you differentiate it, it'll be huge. So I want function that also the derivatives go to zero. So I want that each fixed derivative is smaller than infinity, simply meaning it goes to zero, which lots and lots of functions do. Obviously, anything that's exponentially small in a smooth enough way. Then I can simply take, so this is the Euler McLaurin summation form, but now as a special case of it, I can integrate all the way to infinity. And now I get a half f of zero plus the sum n from one to infinity, let's call it m from one to infinity, f of m, because this sum now goes to infinity. And then I have the sum n from zero to n minus one, minus one to the n, b little n over n plus one factorial, this time I put it in, and then fm of, uh, f the h derivative of m as m goes to infinity is zero. So there's a minus sign, and it's simply fn of zero. And finally, the last term, I'll just put plus or minus because I don't really care and it's too much trouble. It's the integral from zero to infinity of the nth derivative of f times bn bar of x over n factorial. But now n is fixed. I'm not letting n go to infinity as well. n is fixed. And so bn bar of x over n factorial is some function. But it's periodic and continuous. So it's bounded. So this is O of 1. And this function, I'm assuming, goes rapidly to 0, sufficiently rapidly that the integral, uh, uh, so this is convergent. But still, I can't estimate this. But now, let's take t going to 0. Well, t is just positive. But mentally, we take it going to 0. And now, I'm going to integrate. I'm going to replace f of x by f of tx. Then here, I'll have mt. And that was exactly my g of t that I was talking about. So now we're almost uh, finished with the proof of this. So this is, of course, this one. If I have f of t x dx, I just replace x by x over t. It's obviously 1 over t times the integral. So you already see the g of t is i f over t, which was the first part of the theorem I want to get, minus a half f of 0. But if n is 0, you have b1 over 1, which is minus a half b0 t to the 0. So that's OK. And these terms are exactly the same, because remember, I, I, I'd written it already and removed it, but bn was the nth coefficient, which by Taylor is 1 over n factorial times the nth derivative. So therefore, bn plus 1 over n plus 1 bn is bn plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial times the nth derivative, uh, except that now, because of the nth derivative of the function of tx is n to t to the n times the old nth derivative. And then finally here, the capital nth derivative is t to the n times the value of the nth derivative of fn of x. So I think it means, I can't do this in my head, uh, it's t to the n. And then I replace t by t, uh, x by x over t. Then it goes back to being x. And I think it's t to the n minus 1, so the coefficient would be right. And here, I've done something very weird. Now it's x over t. And so it's got a completely different periodicity. But who cares? n is fixed, and bn is bounded. So whatever this is, this is O of 1. And this whole integral is, is also is just a constant. So it's O of 1. I mean, it's fixed. It's a number. But it's, it's bounded by a number. So it's O of 1. And here, I have t to the n minus 1. It may be t to the n, t to the n plus 1. Who knows? But you see that as n gets larger, I'm not saying anything converges, but you'll get more and more terms. And so this is an asymptotic expansion. That completes the proof. I'll stop talking for a minute so you can catch your breath, and also so I can look how far I've gotten. I see, I thought I didn't have enough, and I see I've covered three pages out of seven. So it doesn't look like I'll finish what I prepared, but that's OK. Uh, I'm going to go on in a second. Well, let, let me just send. So when you use the euler mclaurin summation formula, it's very useful. It's very useful anyway, but there are two basic scenarios. And both are important for asymptotics. One is you take this m to be infinite. So then you have to assume f is nice and small than infinity. That's the infinite version, which is less familiar and less in the textbooks. And this is essentially just the infinite version of the euler mclaurin summation formula. But I really wanted to prove the whole thing for you. That was statement one. But the finite one is also very useful. 
Because let's say f of something, and you don't want to sum to infinity, and there's no t anymore, you have the fixed function. I'm not remembering what we did here. We had to rescale by t, because if I just ask what's the sum of f of n, well, that's just a number. It doesn't really make any sense. To make any sense for a problem of this type, you have a variable. So here I put an f of n t, but I sum to infinity. But of course, what you can also do is say I sum from m from 1 to capital M. And ask, what can I say about that? For large number, I fix the function and truncate rather than going to infinity but rescaling. And then this is exactly what this formula does for you. So let me give an, another example. So th an example of the finite use. And this is the kind of thing we'll talk about starting uh, certainly on Thursday. Is here, so an example. I'm going to take f of x to be 1 over x squared. But of course, if I take 1 over x squared, the infinite sum is fine, or even the finite sum. I have a little bit of trouble with f of 0, and also the integral of 1 over x squared. So as I did it here, I take, that won't work, I take x plus 1 squared, or I use the integral from 1 to m uh, and, and do the same thing that I just did. Obviously, I didn't have to start at 0. It was a choice. I was always doing on the intervals of length 1 and adding them up. So if I do this, then what I'll get, and that's exactly, remember, I told you that when Euler computed the, solved the Basel problem by computing the sum 1 over 2 squared, what he did was to invent the euler maclaurin summation formula and get a very accurate version for the sum of the first m reciprocal squares. And so it's some constant which people already knew it was finite, and that, let's call it zeta 2. That's the infinite sum. But then there's a remainder. And the remainder, you can now, I want to copy it because I'll get all the signs wrong. The remainder, uh, according to his function formula, is exactly minus 1 over m plus a half over m squared minus a sixth over m cubed plus a thirtieth over m to the fifth. And now it's kind of nice because these are exactly the numbers. I think I removed my table, but these are exactly the numbers that are in the table on the nose. Minus, well, if I put zeta 2 minus that, minus a half plus a six minus a 30th plus a 42nd, it continues, you know, 1 30th minus 5 over 60. They're exactly the Bernoulli numbers. So it's exactly minus bk over k, uh, m to the minus k uh, divided by m. So, well, it's the sum of that over k. So it, this is, a, of course, you, it's not just for 1 over n squared. You can equally do 1 over n cubed, and Euler did, and 1 over n to the fourth and so on. When he computed 1 over n cubed, he could get 20 digits. And he said, I'm sorry, I was not able to recognize that. For zeta 4, he recognized, despite the fourth over 90. And he said it would be an interesting question to identify this number. But now, you know, 300 years have gone by, and we still don't know, 400 years. Uh, no, 300 years, 350. We still don't know what zeta 3 is in terms of anything else, and nobody seriously believes that there is a formula. It's a new number. So, but you can compute it uh, easily to you know, 20 or 30 digits, even by hand, if you limit to a little arithmetic, as order was, just by using this summation formula. And this is a typical asymptotic thing. You have a sum, and you want to find the infinite sum. So you say the infinite sum is whatever it is. Let's just call it s for sum. But then there's a correction term. And if you can write down that correction term a priori, then you know everything. And if the function is very regular, in principle, you can do it this way. But there's another way, which I'll talk about next time. So OK, so those are the two basic uses of the euler maclaurin summation formula for finite sums of a fixed function, f of 1 plus f of 2 up to f of m, as it, it may not, of course, have an infinite sum. So there might be, for instance, a, a case that you could also do you take 1 over m, then, of course, this diverges by, like log m. And by definition of the Euler constant, the next term is gamma, because that's how you define it. And then there's something that I can't do in my head. It's uh, undoubtedly 1 over 2m. And then there'll be something that I certainly don't know in my head. Check it. But these numbers will, again, be the Bernoulli numbers. And it's exactly the same formula. The only difference is because of the slight divergence, there's a slight fill up, and you get the Euler's constant. I'll come back to that. Uh, a little later, as I have still today. OK, so, so those are the two versions, finite and infinite, after we do the scheduling, so, uh, the re rescaling. 
So let me say very briefly that there are several variants of this, so that at least I can finish today. And then I may start with a slightly non-trivial example, or I may not, and do it less next time. And then I'll come to the interesting examples next time, and, and then there'll be a pause, and I'll come back to that later. So variant one is you take a G, let's call it alpha of T, well, uh, G of T, I, I fix alpha bigger than zero, and G of T now, and then I'm fixing it. F is also some fixed function. And this will be alpha T, alpha plus one T, and so on. So if alpha is one, it's what we had before. So this is the same sum as before. Let's say alpha is a third. So here's zero, here's T, here's two T. Then if alpha is a third, I take you know, a third of T, four thirds of T, seven thirds of T, and so on. So if you do exactly the same Riemann and Euler joke that we did before, then you'll see that the leading term, of course, this is still a Riemann integral. The fact that I've shifted, it doesn't change anything. It's still a Riemann integral for one over T times the integral. But the other terms would now be the sum. Uh, so again, I'm assuming, remember, I'm always assuming, I forgot to put it in the proposition because I'd written it before. I'm assuming that my Fn has an expansion of the coefficients are Bn. So now, if I do it a la Euler, I have the sum. But now it's f from zero to infinity, f of m plus alpha times t. And so now by the same argument, f of t is the sum bn t to the n. But now I replace t by m plus alpha times t, then t to the n is t to the n times m plus alpha to the n, but that's simply the Horvitz zeta function, zeta alpha at minus n. So which, and this one again is up to a sign, which I won't try to remember, I can look it up in my notes is Bn of alpha, Bn plus one of alpha over n plus one. So if alpha is one, it's exactly the formula we had before. Okay? Uh, and this formula is still due to Euler and the same proof, and I actually gave it last time when I talked about how to compute Dirichlet series. I, I remind you, Z of S alpha is defined originally, this is the Horvitz zeta function. Uh, it's defined originally if real part of S is bigger than one, and it's simply the sum m from zero to infinity, not one over m to the s, as the Riemann zeta function is, but shifted, m plus alpha to the s. And then exactly the same argument that uh, we used for the Riemann zeta function said that, the, that this is a simple pole at s equals one. That simple pole is reflected in this integral term, and then the other terms are what I just said. So I'll, I'll write it at random, hoping I get it right, and then check in my notes if I got the sign right. I think it's the correct sign, but if it's not, it's, it's a minus sign. It it's actually seems to be correct, the n plus one. And now it's the same principle that I told you before in this sum, only this term is global. Only this depends on the whole integral from zero to infinity. So if I change my f to another f, which is the same, very, exactly the same to all, or it can even be different everywhere, but it's the same to all orders. So it's infinitely oscillatory at the origin, then, only the integral term will change, one over t, and the whole thing will be identically zero. In particular, if you have a function that's infinitely small at zero, for instance, a function which is supported away from zero, so I might have a function which looks like that and sum that. Well, then you find it's very nice that you just get the integral over t, the Riemann term. There is no correction at all. The correction only comes from the nth term, and it is bn plus one at alpha. Of course, it depends on the alpha on the shift. So that's the first variant, and it's often useful. And of course, as a variant of the variant, we could also take this sum. So what if g of t is the sum? Now I go back to 1 to infinity. But I put in, for instance, a Dirichlet character, any periodic function. It doesn't matter what. For instance, a Dirichlet character, if you don't know what they are, it doesn't matter. Any periodic function, for instance, minus 1 to the m. Well, if it's a periodic function, let's say this period 3, then uh, I can write, well, again, I'm off the t. Then I can replace t by t over 3. I mean, if I take all the multiples of 3, I'll have chi of 0 times the sum f of n times 3t. Then I'll have the f of 1, but it'll be shifted by a third. So from this formula, I get that. And then it's exactly the same principle. And this will be exactly what you would get from the Euler, the, the, the Riemann integral and the Euler argument, uh, except that now, what you'll get is simply the value 
multiplied by chi in the second place. So it's L of S chi, not L of chi S. So it's L of minus N at chi. If chi is the trivial character, L of S chi is the Riemann zeta function. So that's, uh, so you have both a shifted version and a twisted version, but they're the same because the twist, this is just a sum of finitely many shifts after rescaling. So those are frequently useful, but they're uh, very simple variants. Then another variant, what if F had a more general expansion at zero? And this is frequently useful. So for instance, what if F of t had a term I'll give a simple example. What if there were one extra term, be a half t to the one half, but everything else was like it was before? Well, you can just guess immediately what this g of t, defined as before is the sum f of nt, will be i f of t. It still converts, it still is integrable. So i f still makes sense. And then it'll be d0 times z of 0, plus b, minus, uh, b a half times z of minus a half times t to the half, and so on, because you just did the Euler argument, and this t to the half is multiplied by the sum 1 to the half plus 2 to the half plus 3 to the half, which is 8 of minus half. And it's completely legitimate by the same argument. So more generally, if f of t is some kind of a sum, lambda, the lambdas could even be complex, but the real part of lambda, let's say, is bigger than minus 1 so, and goes to infinity. And then I'll have some b lambda t to the lambda. See, I need this in order for the function at 0 to be integrable and for the thing to make sense. Then g will be exactly what you'd expect, plus the sum b lambda t to the lambda. The same lambda. Uh, sorry, z of minus lambda. So you have the Riemann term. And similarly, of course, you can do a shift. I'm not going to combine them all and have the Horvitz zeta function at lambda. Now, you might say, what if lambdas Let's just stick to real numbers, because complex exponents never happen in real life. What if lambda is less than minus 1? Well, if it's strictly less, uh, remember, the whole thing is additive. Whatever I do, if I know the answer for f1 and f2, then g1 plus g2 is I just add them. So if I have a term 1 over t squared, it's, of course, completely idiotic. Then I can just say, let f of t be equal to 1 over t squared. Then g of t is the sum 1 over n squared t squared. It's simply z of 2. Uh, t to the minus 2, obviously. So it's clear that if I have a term b lambda t to the lambda, and lambda is less than minus 1, then minus lambda is bigger than 1. This is actually convergent. This part is OK. What isn't OK is, of course, if is not divergent. So you have to subtract off the singularity. But why bother? You can just write your function as the sum of two functions, one like this and one that's trivial. So there's only one interesting case. What if we have a term t inverse? Well, now, by the same principle, I don't have to write the whole infinite sum. I'll just say what t inverse does. Because, well, no, I do have to say because the integral won't make sense. So here the variant will be as follows. If f of t looks like some b minus 1 over t plus the sum, well, I don't have to write like that, the sum from minus 1 to infinity, e n t to the n, then g of t, well, it's not very surprising that the b minus 1 over t will give you a term log 1 over t. Because there is, after all, it's 1 over t, and we're multiplying 1, 2, 3. So I'm multiplying by 1 plus a half plus a third, which is log of something. So it's reasonable that it's log of 1 over t. And then there's still a constant, and that should be the Riemann constant. But of course, the integral no longer converts. So I have to change if. I have to tell you what the integral is. And the other terms are, of course, not affected. Because remember, everything is local. So whatever happens, the effect of this minus one term has nothing to do with the others. They don't interact at all. So all that you need is this. And the proof of this is very easy, and especially if I finish it by telling you what i f star is. It's simply the integral, the same integral we had before, but I simply subtract. And then, the, see, it's really easy. You just take the function e to the minus x over x. Well, that's integral. At infinity, it's small. And at, x, at 0, it has a 1 over x. So this difference is smooth. And now I just apply the old thing to e to the minus x. Again, it's additive. I only have to do this once for e to the minus x. So to prove this, I just take f of t to be equal to 1 over t e to the minus t. Then g of t, which is the sum m from 1 to infinity, it's 1 over mt e to the minus mt. But of course, this is simply 1 over t times the log of 1 minus e to the minus t. And that's the one I gave an exercise at the beginning. It's still the Bernoulli numbers, and so we're finished. So it's, it's absolutely easy to prove this. And uh, then the final variant, so this would be variant 2. So variant 1 is 
uh, shifts shifted and or twisted. Nice to have names, Euler McLaurin. Uh, variant two, which is written, I didn't write the words, I think. Variant two is allowed terms at zero, uh, which are powers as before, but lambda is no longer uh, in a non-negative integer, but for instance, a negative integer or, or even a complex number. Okay, and then the final variant, and that you'll, you should be able to see in, in your head how it goes, is uh, yet more general, and all of these are extremely useful in practice, allow terms uh, t to the lambda log t uh, or log t to some power. Remember, I've mentioned before in an earlier lecture, those are exactly the functions, the span of all functions of the form, a complex power of t times a non-negative integral power of log t, those are the functions that are gm finite. In other words, they're scalings, they're rescalings by t goes to at, line a finite dimensional vector space. Well, if I allow that, let's just do the first one, because if you know how to do one, you can do them all. This is, of course, nothing other than the lambda derivative of t to the lambda. And therefore, you just take the old form and you differentiate it, and so you get something. So what you get, well, since I've been written down, I might as well write it down in that case. So that means that t to the lambda log lambda, of course, I'll have you, assuming that lambda is bigger than minus one, the interval is still convergent. So the IF part is the same. I only have to give the single term that you get here. And what you'll get is a of minus lambda uh, log 1 over t plus say the prime of minus lambda uh, times t to the lambda. So if you have a term t to the lambda, before t to the lambda, you just multiply it by say of minus lambda. Now we have to differentiate, take actually the negative derivative, but I didn't get any signs wrong. Uh, wrong, then this is the, that's that answer. So in particular, if t is, uh, if it's just log t, which is actually the commonest case of that, where do I, uh, yeah, so in particular, so the easiest case, well, is if it's just log t, in which case I might as well assume that the coefficient is one, because take a multiple, then g of t will be the usual i f of t. And then, multiple mistakes, the next term is minus a half log. I'm using that zeta prime of 0, minus a half, I think, log of 2 pi. Here you'll get minus a half log of 2 pi over t, plus, and then the terms that we already found, b n zeta of minus n. So, actually, I have now done five pages out of seven of my notes, even, yeah. So I was, th those are all the variants. Now, I've given you the basic story, which is what I said at the beginning. If f is nice, but nice might be smooth, but it might be less smooth, like you could have some strange powers, t to the one half, or t to the minus half, or t, uh, t to the something log t. And you make this infinite sum, then I've told you how it looks. as as a corollary of the euler maclaurin summation formula and its many variants. And I'd prepared, well, they're also in the written thing, but I'll give the same examples. There are four examples, two very easy and two much trickier, and they're extremely illuminating and I absolutely want to do. They will also shed light on the relationship, which uh, actually Emmanuel asked me about, between the euler maclaurin summation formula and the Poisson summation formula, which I mentioned very briefly last time. And let me say in a word, the Poisson summation form is more useful. Uh, it's much, much simpler. What the Poisson summation form is, says is if I have a function, a nice smooth function that's on the real axis, and I sum it at regular intervals, the sum f of n, or f of n t, but after rescaling. So I take the sum. Then, well, I can even remind you, the sum of f of n for any nice function, n in z, is the same as the sum of f tilde of n where n is the correctly normalized Fourier transform. And it's incredibly useful when you use it all the time. But it only applies if you have a sum over a whole lattice. What we're doing here is a sum over half a lattice. And that's much, much harder. Because you've, you've killed the symmetry. A sum over a lattice, well, you've also introduced an edge term. 
After all, if, if you could do any sum from 1 to infinity, then by replacing f by f of n plus 100, you could do this sum from 101 to infinity. And by subtracting, you'd f, f of, you know, the sum from 1 to 100. But you can't expect a uniform formula for the sum of any function anywhere. I mean, there's, there's a limit. So it's obviously much, much harder to do a thing with n terms than something without n terms. And the n terms screw you up. And of course, you could just say, well, why don't I take my nice function, say Gaussian, and I just cut it off at 0. But then the Fourier transform will be huge in infinity, and the sum won't converge. So it simply doesn't work. So if, and that's a nice exercise, if f, in fact, let's do that now, and then I'll stop with that. If bn is 0 for all odd n, that means that f is, even though it's a smooth function, it's on zero infinity. Now I can extend it by evenness, and it's still smooth on both sides. And now I can apply Poisson. And so what I'll get, I'll do it next time in more detail. But you'll see that in this formula, bn is zero if n is odd, but bn plus one is zero if n is even. And every n is even or odd, with one exception. The one exception is b1, which is not zero. And so you get only the term i zero, then g will be i f over t. And you've only the term here when n is 0, in which case I've b1, which is minus a half, so b0, which is f of 0. And that's to all orders. And that's exactly what the Poisson observation, sorry, and this is a half. And the reason for the half is because really we're summing from 1 to infinity here. But I should sum from minus infinity to infinity. That would include b0, but I would have it twice. And so you need that. And then this is the Poisson summation form. So of course, the Poisson summation form is much stronger than that, because it tells you what the O of t to the n is. It's not merely asymptotic. It's exact. This is merely asymptotic. So the answer is less good. But the problem is much better, because it's a much harder problem. So both, neither one uh, you know, replaces the other in its usefulness. But I want to have said that now. I'll do that again next time. Next time is Thursday, same time, same place. And thank those of you who came personally for coming personally, because it's nice to see live people. And thank those of you who came virtually, because it's nice to see dead people. No, because it's nice that you're coming anyway. OK, are there any questions, virtual or live? Please? Yeah, I think if you just speak, I, have, I can shout it out. But it's easier if you have a microphone. Easy yeah. for me, too. Is there some reason why this um, Euler plus Riemann argument actually gives the right answer? Basically, because both Euler and Riemann did it correctly. So namely, I cheated on both. Riemann was trying to define an integral for a much more general class of functions. And then his, his definition of the integral is it is the sum in the limit. So his thing says that asymptotically to the first order, it is i f over t. So that's true. Euler of course, did not do this. He wouldn't just interchange two sums and say, look, everything is fine. And he would know that the answer is always wrong, because, of course, you missed the term. Of course, he found the euler mclaurin summation form. He did it quite correctly. It's just a way to remember. But there is a reason that, formally, the coefficient of 1 over t has to be the integral, basically by Riemann's argument. And the others, it can't be anything except, say, of Lambda, let me make a very crude argument. This is so bad that I don't really like it. Let's say that you've understood, and maybe Manuel can tell us he's a professional analyst. I'm not. What the reason is for the thing I've emphasized several times, if f is exponentially small at the origin, then you'll simply get a constant over t. Oh, I do see the argument. Sorry, I don't need a Manuel. It's OK. Next time, I'll, when it's more serious. If the function. You see, we're not talking analytic, we're talking smooth. If the function vanishes to all orders of the origin, then bn is 0 for all 0 n, in particular for all odd n. So it's even, so I can, I can uh, we're assuming it's smaller than infinity. So I can make it an even function. I can apply this, and actually b0 is also 0. So you see, this special case is simply Poisson applied to a smooth function on the whole line. And therefore, that tells you why you only get a 1 over t term if all of the coefficients at the origin are 0. But that tells you that the coefficients of g only depend, except for the 1 over t term, only depend on the coefficients of f. But you could say, well, why couldn't the coefficient in g of t to the fifth be a combination, a linear combination of b0, b1? Why is it just a multiple of b5? But that's obvious. Whatever the theorem is, 
applied to f and applied to f of 2t. Then the coefficient of t to the fifth changes by of, of t to the fifth changes by 2 to the fifth. But in G, each term changes by a different amount. The only way it can work is if it's the same n which is coming in. That's the only way which is scaling invariant. That is indeed the argument that these functions are GM are finite. So in other words, if we use this to see that whatever the argument is, it must be the integral over t plus something whose individual terms define, depend individually on the individual terms, then that means that the coefficient of t to the n has to simply be a multiple of the coefficient of t to the n in f, simply because nothing else is correctly scaled. That coefficient behaves by lambda to the n when you rescale by lambda, but that wouldn't be true if I took any other coefficient. Therefore, you get that the coefficient t to the n here, or t to the lambda here, has to be something times t to the lambda in f and in g. But whatever the argument is, it should be true by analytic continuation. But if lambda is very negative, then Euler's formal argument is simply correct. If this is t to the minus 3.2, then I'll get the sum n to the minus 3.2 t to the 3.2. And of course, that is z of 3.2 t to the 3.2. So it's clear that this multiple has to be z of minus lambda. So, uh, so in fact, that is kind of a pure thought explanation of why this is the only thing that, that it could be. I don't know if that really helps, and I gave a proof anyway, but it's not a complete mystery, although I present it a little perversely. It's mostly for the mnemonic version. If you forget all the details, like what's the sign, you know, is it minus one to the n, to the n plus one? You don't need that. It's zeta of minus n, and the reason is just to it formally. It can't be anything else. It's got to be zeta of minus n. And so that's the formal argument and the Riemann argument. So it's more a mnemonic that tells you how to remember it. There's the Riemann way of looking and the Euler way, the formal way, and, and they both are, are giving you pieces of the answer. But of course, if you do the formal thing correctly, that is the euler mclaurin summation formula, and that, that is Euler. So I'm not trying to malign him and say he didn't know how to do this. In fact, this theorem is, is his entirely. I mean, this is just the euler mclaurin summation formula in the special case when m goes to infinity. But then rescaled and thought of as, uh, asymptotically, and that's stuff that people don't necessarily think of, because you usually see it as a finite formula. OK, maybe we should stop. Uh, oh, sorry, there are still questions. But remember, yeah, one if you curiosity. keep coming, you can also ask questions the next time at the beginning. But go ahead. OK. So um, very quick. Is the um, uh, Bernoulli polynomial, are they orthogonal with respect to any measure? Ah, that's an extremely good question. And I know the answer. Well, first of all, I think all polynomials are orthogonal with respect to a measure. You define the measure in that way. Uh, but I know. Can somebody use my email? I will forget. I forget everything. If I write it down, I'll lose the piece of paper. Could somebody send an email and say, remember the question about orthogonality? There's a beautiful property of Bernoulli polynomials that I found, well, I found several, and I found some that were certainly well known in the literature, you know, 50 years old, as I'd expected. Others weren't, and they had to do with the integral, but the ordinary integral for the usual measure of one Bernoulli polynomial against another. I've completely forgotten what the story was, but there is a nice story. So that's a great question because I was going to say it has nothing to do with this course because it's exact and not asymptotic. But I bet that if I think about it, those statements would be very useful for asymptotics, and I never thought of it. So a, a wonderful question. Uh, I'll try to remember between now and Thursday. Otherwise, you or, or anybody who's here can send me an email, don't remember orthogonality. And I'll look, look at what I did and try to remember what, the, what it was. Uh, just for fun. Who knows orthogonal polynomials in the sense that they know the basic definition and properties? Well, you obviously do, yeah. So very few people, well, you obviously do, and you aren't raising your hand if you're doing something else. I was once at one of the famous Gelfand seminars, well, I was several times. I was, in fact, the lecturer, but before they start, he would come at 8 in the evening, which is when it was supposed to start, and talk to the people, there were 100 people would come, he would talk to them all, mostly putting them down, and we wouldn't start till 9 and then go on till 1 in the morning sometimes. And so here he was, uh, 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 he, he cared very much about the education of young people because he'd been very precocious and, and he'd brought up many young mathematicians. Uh, and so somebody was telling me, you know, a young postdoc who was there, said, you know, uh, uh, Israelovich, uh, Israelovich was his name, can't even think. He said, uh, you know, professor, I'm teaching a student, and he's 14, but he's very, very gifted, and I'm showing him. 
So we've already done, and then he went through a whole list, of course, multivariate integration and differential equations, simple partial differential equations, and this and this and this and this. And I was saying with my eyes like that, wow, this kid, maybe he was 15, but anyway, he was certainly, you know, he was not, he was under 16. And so Gelfin listens to this litany of all the things they'd done. This was in a period of three months. He said, you know, that student I told about, we've now done that. And Gelfand just had one question, is, does he know orthogonal polynomials? No. He's got to learn orthogonal polynomials. Everybody has to know orthogonal polynomials. And then he turned away and walked to the next guy. Not one word of praise that this you know, young man had taught some, some, uh, some kid all of this incredible amount of mathematics in three months. Everybody's got to know orthogonal polynomials. So if I answer the question next week, I'll make another digression. Anyway, that's the point of the course. It's all digression. About the basic thing about orthogonal polynomials, but just as a quick test, if there's one word, which is a very familiar theme in number theory and mathematics, but it's infinitely related like this to orthogonal polynomials, what's that word? That nobody gets this, even if you know. It won't strike you. It's continued fractions. It's, it's practically the same thing. You are nodding, but even you aren't, and you certainly know orthogonal polynomials, and need to Laguerre, there are many famous orthogonal polynomials. It's very, very close. And uh, maybe I'll even do something about that. It doesn't have a whole lot to do with asymptotics, but I can pretend. OK, I think enough questions for today. And any other questions, you've got to come back next time, like Shehara Azad. Uh, and then you get your questions answered or not answered next time.